Hi folks, the goal of this video is to learn about optimization or what we might call using calculus to make the most or the least of a situation. So let's just start by noticing that because the earth is tilted, you will experience a certain number of hours of daylight which will vary throughout the year. So you could imagine taking a latitude, say 42 degrees north, and plotting the, the number of hours of daylight as a function of the day of the year. And you'll get a nice sinusoidal graph that varies from a maximum of a little over 15 and a minimum of about 9. So, so there's going to be a day where you have the maximum number of daylight hours and a, and a day when you have the minimum number of daylight hours. And these days are respectively called the summer solstice and the winter solstice. But it is a sort of interesting question to ask, when do you have the most and when do you have the least? And generally, the business of finding maximum and minimum values of a function is known as optimization. Now, the everyday use of the word optimize, you know, a definition would be to make the most of a situation, opportunity, or resource. But when we're looking at functions and trying to optimize values, we might add also that in some sense, we're looking also for the possibility of making the least of a situation. To minimize means to find the argument that gives you the minimum value of the function. And to maximize means to find the argument that gives you the maximum value. So we can throw these together into one category. And if we're looking for to either minimize or maximize, but we don't care which, we could just say we're trying to optimize the value of the function. Here's a strategy for optimization. It is necessarily general because each optimization problem can look quite different from other optimization problems. So first, identify the quantity Q you wish to optimize. This is usually not challenging. It's usually built right into the problem. So maybe there's a cost to build something and you'd like to minimize that cost, or there's an area you're trying to cover with a procedure and you need to maximize the area covered, or you're looking at the fuel efficiency of a vehicle, you wanna maximize the fuel efficiency, or there's a journey you need to plan and you want to minimize the distance traveled, identifying Q is not so hard. So you usually know what value you're trying to optimize. Now, you want to identify a parameter X, we'll call it, that you're able to control directly. So this is going to look very different in each problem. You might be choosing the radius of a sphere, or you might be choosing the number of widgets to build in a factory, or you might be choosing the angle of elevation of a rocket launch, or you might be choosing the height of a box that you're going to build. And now you wanna find a formula that expresses Q in terms of X. And this is the step that constitutes the heart of just about every optimization problem. This is the part that each optimization problem has its own character. And you want to look for inspiration from geometry, algebra, and trigonometry. You gotta really be looking for relationships between, between different quantities. It may seem in a particular problem like there are too many variables. So you've identified something you can control and the quantity you wanna optimize, and yet there are other variables in play that seem to get in the way. They seem to affect Q. And if that is the case, then what you need to do is look for constraints that render these as functions of X. So they're not truly independent quantities. What will happen is you can express each of them in terms of X and you will get in the end a function with just one input X and one output Q. You might consider expressing Q as an implicit function of X. Sometimes the optimization can go just much smoother if you don't try to explicitly solve uh, for x, and we'll look at an example of that later. So now, determine the domain of your function. Knowing your domain, just as a general rule, is a good thing, but this could strongly influence the analysis, as we shall see in uh, two examples. And finally, analyze q prime of x and possibly q double prime of x to decide which arguments optimize q. So this is the part you're ready to do if you've already looked at what the sign of the first derivative tells you about monotonicity, what the second derivative tells you about concavity. These are all possible tools in analyzing your function and arriving at the optimal arguments. So here's our first example. 12 meters of fencing is used to enclose a rectangular pen next to a barn. Fencing is required on only three sides of the pen. What are the dimensions of the pen that encloses the most area? 
So you've got your 12 meters of fencing and you're going to bend it in two places and place it against the barn to create your pen. Let's give names to the quantities. Let's call this width x and this other dimension y. And the area is not hard to calculate here. It's x times y. But that seems to be one too many variables. We'd like to reduce this to just one input variable. So what we'll do is we will in fact use x, this one width near the bottom, as our parameter that we can control. And we realize we don't truly then have um, sort of an independent value of y. It's determined by this equation. 2x plus y has to be 12 because we're using 12 meters of fence. So in this case, this is what we might call our constraint in the problem. And from this, we discover that y has to be 12 minus 2x. So what can we do with this? We can go back to our formula for a, substitute 12 minus 2x for y. Now, there are two things we could do with this, and I'm going to do both of them. I could factor out a 2x and get this nice factored form, which has its use. And I'm also going to multiply through and rearrange a little bit and get negative 2x squared plus 12x. I actually want to have both of these forms in front of me. So here's the domain. We need to figure out the domain. So let's just draw our barn and notice that we could choose x equals 0. Um, pretty strange choice, perhaps, but we could do that. We could just lay all the fence right up next to the barn. Now, if x is a little bigger than that, some positive number, uh, we might get a rather narrow pen. And by choosing x larger, we can sort of make it more square-like. And we notice that there is another extreme case where you could let x be 6, which is to say you, you let the fence go all the way at 6 feet, and then you bend it right around on itself and go back 6 feet to the barn. And once again, you haven't enclosed any useful area there. So it appears that our domain can be taken to be the closed interval from 0 to 6. And I'll just point out, take a look at this factored form. This is quite useful here. You'll notice that if x is less than 0, you get a negative area. And clearly we don't want that, so that's out. And if you let x be greater than 6, you also get a negative area. So we have to exclude both of those cases on physical grounds because not only are they cases we don't care about, they're nonsensical cases. Somehow we must eliminate those arguments from the domain. But it's a little more interesting to look at the case of 0 and 6. After all, this formula shows you quite clearly that you'd get 0 area, which is intuitively clear from our picture. And so the question arises, these seem like silly choices. Why would we want to include them in the domain? And the answer is because the function a is continuous on the closed interval from 0 to 6. There's no harm in including them. And in fact, by including them, we have a really slick algorithm for analyzing this problem because we can use the closed interval method. So just be aware that sometimes there are arguments that you wonder if you should include in the domain. If you're able to include them and get a closed interval and the function you're trying to optimize is continuous on that closed interval, do it. Throw them into the domain because then you have this nice algorithm. So we can use the closed interval method here. So we're going to calculate our derivative and this is where the the bottom form there on the left is handy, so we're going to take negative 4x plus 12, that's our derivative. Set it equal to 0. What does this imply? x equals 3, that's our only critical number. So we're going to evaluate this function at the critical number, which is inside the interval, and the two endpoints, we'll throw those in. Of course, the value at the endpoints is 0, and the value at x equals 3 turns out to be 18. And so we can just simply look at this and the closed interval method guarantees that um, this is the largest value we're going to get. And so we should choose x to be 3. And then, by the way, looking at the constraint, 12 minus 2x is the value of y. So when you substitute 3 into that, we get y equals 6. So the dimensions of the pen that have the largest area possible out of this configuration is 3 by 6. Example B, a box has a square base and a volume equal to 16 cubic feet. What's the least possible surface area of such a box? By the way, I should point out that this box has no top. It's an open top box. There's only a base and the top is open. So there's going to be four sides and a bottom to this box. So these five different sort of panels, we have to construct the box in a way that the base is square and the total volume is 16. Now, let's give names to these dimensions. So the base is a square, so we can use x, must use the same variable for both sides here. And then let's let h be the height of this box. Now the area, total surface area, the amount of 
wood if that we use to build this box. So there's going to be a base which has uh, area x squared, that's the square base. There are four sides, each of which has area x times h. So this is your formula for the area a. And once again, you'll notice that there seems to be one too many variables. So what is our constraint in this case? Well, the volume has to be 16. So x squared times h must be 16. And from this, you can derive the fact that h then is 16 over x squared. So once again, you don't just get to pick x and h willy-nilly. You have to pick a combination that, that guarantees the volume is 16. That's your constraint. So from this, we can substitute back in on the left side here our formula for area and simplify that. And you get x squared plus 64 over x. Now, let's imagine what the domain should be. So we'll put an open interval from zero to infinity and we'll imagine where along this interval we should be allowed to choose our x's and one of the things you want to notice is this constraint over here implies that no matter what argument x you choose as long as it's not zero you can find a height which guarantees that your volume is 16. so the consequence is you can choose x to be extremely tiny and that just means you're going to have to have a very tall box to get your 16 cubic feet. Or you can choose x to be very large, in which case your height will be very small. You just need a tiny height to enclose the volume. But the bigger point here is that you may indeed choose x to be any positive number you wish. So the domain of our function is the open interval from 0 to infinity. Now, since it's an open interval, this is clearly not going to be a candidate for the closed interval method. Our analysis necessarily has to be a little more sophisticated. So now let's start with the function expressed this way, x squared plus 64x to the negative one. We can use the power rule to calculate the derivative quickly. We will clean this up and write it as a fraction. And now I like to factor out things that are going to be helpful for a sign analysis. So in this case, what I'm going to do is factor out 2 over x squared, and that leaves 2 over x squared times the nice polynomial factor x cubed minus 32. Now, if we want to analyze the sign of a prime of x, we'll notice that this factor, 2 over x squared, is positive throughout the domain of the function, so we can ignore it in the sign analysis. And that makes it a lot easier to analyze the sign because it all boils down to the sign of this factor. But that's just a simple polynomial. So we'll graph it here and notice that its sole root is at the cube root of 32, which is also known as 2 times the cube root of 4. So here's our only root of the derivative in its domain. And so we'll mark that appropriately on this domain. And we'll just notice that the sign of the polynomial is easily found by just looking at your sketch. You know that for free, you know that the value of this is negative from zero to the root and then it's positive past that root. So we have a sign analysis that's immediate. And from this sign analysis, we can now say that the function is decreasing on the open interval from zero to two times the cube root of four and then decreasing on the interval from two cube root of four to infinity. So the absolute minimum value of the area function is the area function evaluated at that argument, which is about 30.238 30 square feet. Example C. Let C denote the circle of radius 10 centered at the origin. What is the location of the point on C that is closest to the point 4 comma 3? We choose a point x, y on the circle somewhere and let D capital D denote this distance. Now, the Pythagorean formula tells us that d squared should be x minus 4 quantity squared plus y minus 3 squared. What we'll do is we will allow this to implicitly define d as a function of x. The calculation is going to get quite a lot messier if we extract the square root and then start taking the derivative of that. I think it's much easier to deal with this implicitly. And so thinking of this as implicitly defining d, we can take the derivative with respect to x and what we'll get is 2d derivative of d with respect to x is equal to 2 times the quantity x minus 4 plus 2 times the quantity y minus 3 times dy dx. Critical, don't forget the chain rule there at the end. 
we'll simply cancel the factors of two that come throughout, and we'll notice that we have this dy dx. What is dy dx? Well, we haven't used our constraint yet. We haven't uh, noticed that we must lie on the circle x squared plus y squared equals 100. So we'll take the derivative over here implicitly. And from this, we can discover that the derivative formula as a function of both x and y is negative x over y. So we'll substitute this into our formula and we'll divide through by d. There is a nice formula for the derivative of d with respect to x. Now we need to analyze the sign of this derivative just as we would in the two previous uh, examples that we looked at. And we'll notice that this factor out here, we should not be concerned with this because d, you can just look at the picture, anytime you choose a point on the circle, d is positive. So this isn't gonna cause a problem either in the domain or the sign of the derivative. So if the derivative is going to be zero, it forces this quantity to be zero. So we have an equation that we can work with and we'll just do some simple algebra and cancel these factors, rearrange a little bit, and we see that y has to be 3 quarters x. Now what does this mean? If you plot the line y equals 3 quarters x, you'll notice that it's going to intersect this circle in two points. What are we looking for? We're actually looking for the location of these two points. These are our candidates because these are the locations where the derivative of the distance function vanishes. They're the only possible places where we're going to get our minimum value. So to find these, we'll simply substitute 3 quarters x in for y. We're going to multiply both sides by 16. Simplify this a little bit and this means that x squared winds up being 64 and x is either negative eight or positive eight. And if we look at our diagram, we can see then what's happening. Negative eight corresponds to an answer to a question we were not asked, what point is farthest from four comma three? And you should realize that this is also an optimization problem. And of course we should get this answer because the very first step you would do in solving that problem was exactly the same as we did trying to find the minimum we need in either case to find where the derivative is zero. So we're getting a bonus answer, so to speak. Now the argument we're looking for is this one, eight. That's pretty clear from the picture, which of the two we want. And by the way, we're not going to go into great depth trying to analyze the sign, S-I-G-N, of the derivative or analyze the domain because we have a pretty compelling intuitive picture here of what's going on. We can tell that uh, this process has found for us the location of the points that are not only, not only the point that's closest to 4, 3, but the point that's furthest away from 4, 3. So we're gonna let intuition sort of um, play a big role in this problem here and just declare victory. Now, you can substitute x equals eight back into the equation for the circle and discover that y has to be six here. And so our conclusion is that the point on c closest to the point 4, 3 has coordinates eight, six.